Welcome to episode nine of the Arkham Sessions. My name is Brian Ward. And I'm Dr. Andrea Letamendi. And today we are focusing on the episode Be a Clown, yet another with our favorite villain, the Joker. I think this is the third episode now that features the Joker. This is our third episode with the Joker. Uh, before we get into it, uh, once again, Drea, you made a podcast appearance last week. Right. That's true. I appeared on the Geek Therapy podcast uh, with my good friend, Josue, who runs this really cool site, um, sort of celebrating and informing people about psychology and um, everything from video games to comic books to comic conventions and so forth. And uh, it was a lot of fun. We actually talked about, of course, Batman and Batgirl and um, what we've been working on for the past uh, couple of months. So it's been fun. Where can they find that episode? They can find it on geektherapy.com, and I believe I'm in the 36th episode. Great. Okay, so let's get started. Episode 9, Be a Clown. This one was uh, this one aired September 16th, 1992. It's the ninth in the production order, but it's the 11th in the air order. Uh, it was written by Ted Pedersen and Steve, and Hay- or Steve Hayes, and uh, was directed by Frank Parr. Um, it's interesting because Bruce Tim actually says that he got the idea for this story when, uh, he wanted to introduce a story where, uh, Batman was trying to save a child, but the child was too terrified of Batman, um, which is a story we've actually seen a couple of times since this episode, most recently in the new 52, uh, who was it? Greg Hurwitz wrote, uh, an issue with the scarecrow, uh, where the little girl was, was equally scared of Batman when he came mm-hmm. in to, to rescue her. Mm-hmm. Well, and tragically, she had experienced a lot of um, trauma prior to meeting Batman, so she may have already been um, in an emotional state where, you know, seeing this, this man and this cape and suit um, and mask could have been frightening to her. Um, and let's remember that he chose his, um, his costume, if you will, to be one that's menacing and, and his... His objective is to frighten others. So uh, so that doesn't always work out oh, no. in his favor when you're actually dealing with the people he's saving. Right. Um, but we are introduced to the mayor who has a much brighter sense, maybe um, unrealistic, or maybe it's just optimistic, um, much brighter sense of what Gotham is. He thinks it's a much safer city than it really is. And under my leadership, no city will be safer or more free of crime than Gotham City. Uh, you, you really can't illustrate it any better than while he's giving this speech, he is interrupted by two criminals who drive through and uh, start shooting the place up. Yeah, it's basically a police chase that occurs right through the mayor's speech. It's it's basically proving him wrong. Like, actually, this is an unsafe city, and a lot has to be done to to correct that. And then Batman makes a rare daytime appearance to swoop in and save the day before swooping right back out. Uh, the mayor establishes that uh, it really it's just a couple of bad eggs in Gotham that are making it unsafe. For the most part, it is very safe. And Summer Gleason asks if Batman is one of those bad eggs. Absolutely. He and criminals like the Joker are cut from the same cloth. And this doesn't particularly go over so well with the Joker, who in the shadows is watching this newscast and takes quite a bit of offense to likening Batman to himself. Right. It's basically insulting to him. His, um, you know, he's fairly narcissistic and, you know, hearing that somebody is just like him and the Batman is just like him, even worse, he takes great offense to that and decides that he is going to prove the mayor wrong. And he does so by appearing at the mayor's house for the mayor's son's birthday party, at which this kid, who's pretty much a loner, um, doesn't know any of the other kids there. They're all the the sons and daughters of the fellow politicians and Gotham City elite. Uh, so they're all basically uh, business acquaintances of the mayor. Right, and there's this interesting sort of connection that this kid Jordan has with this clown who's there as entertainment. Now, he goes by Jekko the Clown, 
and you know we all we all know at this point this has got to be the joker he's he's uh performing magic tricks he's entertaining the children he's very but he's a little happy. twisted he's a like, little there's a little there's something there that's not quite yeah. right the jokes are a little off color sure birthday boy i'm saving the best for last he he keeps alluding to things or people getting hurt in some way or another now for starters i love this kid because he has uh, an affection for magic Mm -hmm. Drea, you of all people know that I am quite the magic nerd. Yes. Um, been to the magic castle here in Hollywood on a regular basis. I, I just can't get enough of, yes. of magic. So to see this kid by himself in the beginning uh, practicing magic for his stuffed animals and his toys. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now perform my famous disappearing wand trick. I totally dig this kid. Like he's he's <laughs> he won right you up, over yeah. with yeah. that. Oh, I'm totally, yeah. Well, what's sad about that scene is that, you know, the mayor who's his father comes in. Jordan, stop fooling with those stupid magic tricks. Yeah, and, um, you know, not cool. So the well, mayor, not on my not on my cool list. No, up beginning. till now, the mayor is a little bit of a jerk. You know, he's, uh, he's standoffish with his son. He has a political agenda. He's not really connecting with his son. And so his needs, you know, the father's needs at this point is to is to basically rub elbows with these politicians and important, you know, people of the society. And he's not really prioritizing his son's birthday. Jekko, on the other hand, is sort of on the other side of that spectrum. He's just there to have a good time. He's entertaining the children. He's into magic. I mean, he's he has all these qualities that little Jordan is really... Um, is really drawn toward and they have this exchange at the party how can i get to be a great magician like you well there are three steps step one run away step two find a magician with a great act and step three steal it which we see that jordan does jekko the clown produces what he calls a magic candle it's a birthday candle, Einstein. Except this one blows you out. <laughs> and it's a stick of dynamite, essentially, with Joker's face with on it. With the Joker's face on it, right. which is sort of, a, you know. But I don't think tell. I don't think Jekko necessarily uh, knew or expected good old Bruce Wayne to show up with a big present True. for for Jordan. Now, this is an interesting uh, bit. J Bruce Wayne enters. The mayor greets him. And, uh, you know, Bruce is like, where's Jordan? And then uh, the mayor is like, well, you know, you know kids. And what does Bruce say? Not really. He doesn't know how to associate with children. Uh, I think that's part of his Bruce Wayne persona. Although we have seen it in The Underdwellers. He mm. did not know how to interact with this kid. He, he let Alfred not. parent he, he, commi he commissioned Alfred to take care of that particular... Um, scallywag but what I had said you know during that episode is that it was his decision to create this distance with this ch child because he did not want to connect emotionally with him he knew that he would have to quote unquote like give him up he knew he had to go back to the orphanage or his true parents or whatever so I think that was his own protection that was for his own protection I I'm I'm willing to go with you on that however I think you might be giving Bruce a little too much credit Ultimately. I'm not sure this is an act. I think this is Bruce Wayne telling us beyond the fourth wall, you guys know I don't really know kids. Like, I'm not, I'm, ugh, I got nothing. You know, like, I I think the kids probably make Bruce Wayne uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but he does come with this big present. Um, and as he's going outside, he sees the candle, the dynamite burning down and he goes knocks over the cake just in time for it to go into the pool and explode saving the day he looks like a klutz but he ends up saving the day right uh the joker is driving away goes to his his trusty headquarters his hideout there at the amusement park yeah no one would think the joker's at the amusement park right right so 
he goes to the amusement park, um, and we learn on the news. The mayor declined, however, to confirm that his son, Jordan, is missing. So now the news is suggesting that Jekko has kidnapped this kid. Well, the Joker's confused because he knows he didn't kidnap the kid, and that's, you know, baffling to him. But then the kid comes out of the shadows and announces his presence. He has, in fact, run away. He has found a magician with a good act. Right. And now he's wanting Jekko to teach him. Right. He's basically following Jekko's advice. And it's funny because at first the Joker's kind of surprised and a little bit kind of... Maybe uh, even peeved that yeah. he's that he's got this part of his plan that he didn't plan has now turned right. him into a kidnapper as well. Right. There's a second there where he seems annoyed and irritated with uh, the stowaway. But quickly he says, Come on in. I've been thinking about her protege. And I think Jordan is intrigued and definitely, uh, at least initially, amused by it. But um, I, I think there's also some sense that he's frightened. And surely the tricks that the Joker is doing in front of him can be frightening for a kid. Now, what's interesting is the Joker, who already looks like a clown, never removes the Jekko persona. He never, he never reveals himself... Uh, to Jordan as the Joker. Maybe it's because everyone knows what the Joker looks like and they know that he's a villain, uh, you know, criminal. The kid doesn't seem to be a criminal, but the kid definitely doesn't... He yeah. doesn't associate with his father. Um, I, I wonder if it's um, just a mindful decision of the Joker to keep on, you know, keep that mask and makeup on and just right. assume, you know, just keep assuming that persona of Jekko because... He has this audience. He can entertain. He can show off. and He can show off the tricks that he has learned from the great prosciutto. Now there was a ham. Prosciutto is Italian for ham. So Batman shows up to save the day. Um, and he's he shows up at the amusement park and is a little befuddled to find that Jordan is there as the carnival barker. Jekko the Jokester. J Jekko the Jokester. And Batman doesn't understand why Jordan seems to think it's some sort of game. He goes in to uh, rescue Jordan. Jordan runs. Um, and there we learn that Jordan is actually kind of terrified of this Bat figure. Right. It doesn't bode well. He's distracted. The Joker then starts throwing his deadly cards... Uh, you know, playing cards that are very much like blades. They're they're going into the wall. Uh, they're very ninja star like. This actually isn't um, entirely fictional. There are people who can. Um, I'm thinking specifically of a of a magician slash uh, magic historian by the name of Ricky Jay, who's part of his act uh, is to use a deck of real playing cards as uh, throwing knives or wow. ninja star. I mean, he, he sets up a watermelon on the stage and he can throw the, the playing card with such force that it can actually go into the skin of the watermelon. Hmm. Um, so this sort of thing, if the Joker, you know, has figured out Ricky's technique he could theoretically. No, I don't think the playing card is going into a wall, but um, it is not unheard of to use playing cards as weapons. Right. These could be ultra, um, mega playing cards. They, yeah. they could be um, playing cards that are maybe a little sharper, thicker, and able to pierce the wall. And but by the way, if you've never seen Ricky Jay perform his act, uh, Ricky Jay and his fifty-two assistants. Um, it is absolutely fantastic, great in terms of history, um, and and then watching this bit with the uh, the cards is fantastic. So um, you know, I I firmly believe that someone like the Joker could pick up on this technique and could use it to their advantage, uh, particularly somebody like the Joker whose playing cards are you know his signature. Mm -hmm. Well, the Joker's so good at using these weapons that he is able to knock Bruce out and you know this child yeah he's got one that's sort of got a, a gas it's an exploding mm -hmm. gas and it knocks uh Batman out right and uh 
the child is is a, a bit at this point frightened and upset to the point where he's you know asking is he going to be okay and the joker explains like no he's just unconscious and you know let's let's ask the fortune teller what his fate will be and he walks up to madra the uh basically the fortune teller machine that's very similar to the one seen in the movie big yeah yeah uh and the card comes out <laughs> you're gonna love this <laughs> We don't know what it is until we come back from commercial and Batman is upside down in actually uh, a very historically accurate um, trap. This is Harry Houdini's famous Chinese water torture cell. So what does that look like? Like for folks that haven't seen the episode or aren't familiar with Houdini's water torture cell. Yeah. What is the trick? Because it's a magic trick, right? So, yeah. So Harry Harry would spend... Um, about five minutes explaining the device. Uh, he would he would show the audience the the shackles, the um, you know the various uh, things that were going to hold him in locks and and everything that was going to hold him into place. And then he would uh, walk off stage and he would go put on his bathing costume, his you know swimsuit. Um, and his assistants would then fill up this oblong this tall uh, oblong box that um, with high pressure hoses, you know, fill it up. He would then come out onto stage, lay down flat, and would allow them to shackle his feet. Um, then a, the ropes and pulleys would then pull him over the box mm -hmm. and they would drop him in head first mm -hmm. into the water. Um, then they would lock the, the doors mm -hmm. uh, on the top and um, Harry would have to get out of this this box you know they would draw the curtain and and harry would have to get out of this box before he drowned mm -hmm. um it took harry two minutes and one second wow. to get out of this uh to get out of this box um and it was all precisely timed and beautifully done he performed this trick hundreds of times but uh but he was the only one uh i believe if everything that I've read is correct, he was the only one who was doing it during his lifetime. Um, and even for a long period of time after he had died, uh, no one really tried this trick. Yeah. Well, and that emphasizes the dangerousness and difficulty of this trick. Absolutely. That Bruce is uh, sort of finding himself. He was unconscious, so he's waking up to... Um, you know, this box of water. To find out that he's submerged in water, right. yes. I don't like this, Jekko. Quiet, kid. It's a free ticket. Yeah. Yes. And uh, Harry actually, as part of his act, would include an axe uh, there on stage, just in case anyone needed to bust the glass. And what does the Joker have right next to this box? He's got an he axe. He has an axe. And Jordan actually takes the axe and hits the box, the glass with it, to try to save Batman. And right. for a moment, you kind of think like, oh, this kid's going to save Batman. But that doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Uh, he runs off, and uh, the Joker chases after the boy. Batman escapes from the box. They don't make straight jackets like they used to. I should know. And goes after them. Uh, the Joker and the boy climb into a roller coaster, uh, because it's always got a seems like every everything that involving the Joker, any sort of um, any, any sort of memorable story always has to end with him, you know, either on the uh, either in the tunnel of love or on a roller coaster or, uh, you know, some some, you know, well, yeah, train car of some kind. We'll talk about this in a bit, but I find it interesting that this Joker episode um, is really themed around this amusement park, especially right. this fun house. Um, but other things at this amusement park, like roller coasters and, um, you know, other robot clowns and, and these uh, seemingly entertaining but also slightly um, frightening looking things. Um, and remember, it's night at this point. So right. this is an amusement park that's isolated. It's dark. Decrepit. Uh, uh, you know, right. Clearly, it's run down. Yeah. You get the sense that some of these... Um, some of these attractions might not even work anymore. And I just think that it's it, it really exemplifies who the Joker is, right? This thrill-seeking, adventure-seeking, um, sensation-seeking uh, character who is who really identifies with this 
um, you know, these these sets of attractions that that are, are really just to um, not just to entertain, but to frighten us. Right. And uh, the entire episode ends with a fight in the uh, roller coaster. They're on what's called the Twin Terrors. And these are two side-by-side cars on this roller coaster. And you've got the boy and the Joker in one, and then, of course, Batman in the other one. And the Joker is, um, at some point, just flinging these little baby bombs. The two of them ultimately end up in a fist fight. Kicks Joker out. Goes into the water. This is where you get off. It's a cool scene, because while they're in these two separate cars, there are these explosions. And so one car actually explodes and and Batman is able to jump out of that one and onto the car that the Joker and Jordan are on. And, um, you know, then the track is missing because of another explosion. So it's, it's very, um, it's intense. Yeah. Um, Batman brings Jordan back to the mayor and the mayor realizes what he had all along. Uh, realizes that he'd been neglecting his son. He gives him a big hug. Right now, I want to give you the biggest birthday hug you ever got. Jordan gives Batman a big thumbs up. Right, because Batman is like in the bushes creepily watching this father and son having their private moment. Right. You know what? He's trying to understand what these emotions are. (laughs) And uh, the show draws to a close. I think what it comes down to is... um, if you really want to hear me geek out over a cartoon, you introduce magic. Like uh, prestidigitation, not just, you know, sorcery. Right. I, I don't know what that means. Uh, well, you need to hang out with me more often, <laughs> and then you will. Um, so let's talk about the Joker's third appearance. Uh, this is his third session in the very first episode that we saw the Joker. It was Christmas with the Joker. Um, you had come down on the, on the side of, uh, maybe the Joker was leaning a little more toward borderline personality disorder because he had this desire to sort of reach out, um, and emotionally connect with people like Batman. Um, but since then, we have noticed the Joker go darker and darker. Mm-hmm. In the second episode that we saw him in, The Last Laugh, uh, Joker was sort of ready to kill Batman. And in this one, he seems definitely ready to kill Batman. There uh, was, right, there were several um, instances in this episode where he, the Joker was pretty much planning to kill Batman and, and not concerned with um, Batman's well-being whatsoever. And interestingly... You know, we talked about his identity as Jekko and as the Joker. That's the point that the Joker took his Jekko mask off. Right. It was when he and and this kiddo were essentially watching the Batman drown. That mm-hmm. was um, kind of an interesting point to reveal himself. And I think that was him pretty much stating, I intend to kill this man. Right. And I intend for you to watch it. Um, you know, what would that poor kid. What would that do to that kid? Well... Of course, that would be traumatizing, you know, to see Batman drowned to death. But that is also the moment that this kid builds some courage and tries to help Batman. So yeah, you're. I think that you are. You know, your assessment is right. We see some additional instances of the Joker being callous, really conniving, violent, um, certainly willing to murder. And um, we didn't really, you know, we certainly we saw these traits in the first two episodes that we discussed. But I think in that first episode, there was this um, willingness to save Batman or willingness to keep Batman alive, which we see. We see that in comics. We see that in the series. We see that in movies. But um, this episode, he really had so much disregard for Batman's life that he it seemed like he was okay with Batman dying. Yeah, he didn't like being compared to Batman at all. So uh, it's almost like he wanted to get rid of that comparison a little bit. Well, and that goes to uh, another part of his character, another part of his personality, that this um, this comparison between him and Batman really got to him. That really inspired his, his whole criminal, I, I guess, act while he when he went to the birthday party and tried to, to blow everybody up, which is another... Uh, that That just itself, the willingness to uh, 
blow up this cake, which could have killed a number of different kids as well as right. the adults and politicians and so forth. Um, just to prove a point, right? Yeah. And I think that's that's really what I'm getting at here is that he was willing to, um, you know, to murder children and innocent people just to prove a point that the city is unsafe. He has this, he has such a big ego and, um, you know, sense of self uh, that's just like everyone else is beneath him, that even this comparison to Batman irks him enough that he wants to rid, um, he, want, he wants to get rid of Batman. So let's go through the notes. Would you say that your uh, original assessment of Borderline is still uh, the primary diagnosis, or are we watching this character evolve a little bit? That's a great question, and I think that if you remember what we discussed, we said that there were a number of different possible diagnoses for the Joker. Yes. And... um, And I believe I said we had rule out diagnoses or I said, you know, the the other thing that could be going on is antisocial personality disorder. Right. And so it might be. And thus began the great debate. I know. Uh, (laughs) And so what we typically use for pretty much any case is something called a rule out diagnosis or rule out diagnoses. And so these are other um, clinical disorders or or, uh, mental health illnesses that could potentially be. Um, characterizing this person's behaviors and we kind of keep it on the so-called list or keep it in the case or on the profile because we simply at that point of evaluation don't have enough information to determine that that person um, you know is suffering from that particular diagnosis or, or illness as well. So what you're saying is the first time we met the Joker you were leaning your primary diagnosis was sort of borderline Mm-hmm. Um, but your rule out, your your secondary diagnosis uh, could have been antisocial personality disorder. You weren't willing to rule either one out. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, to be clear, he could have both. He could have really? three or four mental illnesses. Sure, sure. A lot of times... It would be terrifying to come across someone who had both borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality. Well, personality let's, disorder. Let's talk about that. Yeah, let's talk about, as a quick review, what is antisocial personality disorder? Um, I think it's unfortunate that it's called antisocial because that Im- implies that that's someone who's shy. This is not someone who's just shy. It's characterized as a long-standing pattern of a disregard for other people's rights. Basically, an enduring, pervasive pattern of misbehavior. And so a lot of times this means... Um, no regard for social rules and norms, but also no regard for the law. So, you know, at its most benign, this may mean petty theft and, and, you know, some criminal activity, but at its most dangerous, it would mean um, being violent, um, hurting other people, being so callous and mischievous um, and lacking empathy that some folks who have this particular illness will actually murder. So as we've seen in this episode, we know that that fits the Joker quite well. What's interesting about this version of the Joker or this episode with the Joker is that he also has this risk-taking type of behavior, like with that trick that he first shows Jordan, it's a sword swallowing trick, and he is showing Jordan how he can swallow this long sword Um, frightening the kid, of course, and then he pulls it out of his mouth and we realize that it's, it's this, you know. It's a trick sword. Yeah, it's a retractable sword. Yeah. Um, But nonetheless, the kid points out like, oh, that could still be dangerous. Yeah. And the Joker says, Hey, if it wasn't risky, I wouldn't enjoy it. Not only does he have this lack of remorse or indifference um, for other people, but he also has this this uh, risk-taking, sort of um, pleasure-seeking aspect to his personality. And that means that not only is he willing to harm you, he's also, like, strangely interested in harming himself and getting, I mean, really, it's getting thrills out of um, life-or-death situations, getting right. thrills out of instigating the Batman because he knows the Batman will come after him. Um, he's getting thrills out of throwing bombs haphazardly outside of his roller coaster car in hopes that, you know, they, they go onto the track. So even the point where he and Batman are fist fighting at the bottom of the car 
on that roller coaster and you actually see that the roller coat the uh the car is going into the what do we call that the the loop the loop <laughs> clearly i'm not where the two where the, the where they should all have shoulder harnesses at this point like the, if they're looping anything they're <laughs> you can't just get be on a with a lap bar on, it on is this. a it is quite the dangerous roller coaster right but that's kind of my point is that they're going into the loop and Batman is on his back and the Joker is, you know, punching into him. And he's got the biggest smile on his face. He's just absolutely getting so much pleasure and enjoyment out of, you know, getting his, you know, kicking Batman's butt um, and going into the loop. And I think that that moment is kind of the essence of who the Joker is. Like that is the, the, the that is sort of like the pivotal moment for him. That's the that's what he wants. He wants to be in a roller coaster loop, getting his ass beat by Batman. Sidebar: um, If this roller coaster, in fact, did not have shoulder harnesses, but has a loop, I think we know why the amusement park is shut down. Right. A lot of people came out of that roller coaster <laughs> on the loop. Let's talk about people who are thrill seekers. I know nothing about roller coasters, and you know quite a bit. You've you've worked at an amusement park, and you're quite familiar with roller coasters and other types of adrenaline rides, thrill yes. thrill rides. Right. Think of it like a spectrum. Like I'm very low on this trait of risk taking because I can't go on roller coasters. Um, I'm too scared of them. I. You know, I can barely watch The Walking Dead. I'm, you know, I'm low on that spectrum. You, on the other hand, have jumped out of a plane to go skydiving. So you, one might consider you to be, you know, moderate to high on the risk-taking spectrum, whereas I'm very low on this spectrum. Now, if you're extremely high on that spectrum, you're going to engage in more risky behaviors, things like drug and alcohol abuse, things like, um, having sex, unprotected sex with strangers, um, gambling excessively, things that it's almost like you have to do something, uh, you know, really extreme to get that sensation, to get that, that feeling of pleasure. And if you add that trait to aggression and hostility, you're going to have someone like the Joker, someone who is a thrill seeker and a risk taker and is also ha- and has this propensity for violence then you've got someone who actually might murder out of you know that need to get that that pleasure so if you're saying that that kind of person is the type of person that would kill why take the kid under his wing why not kill the kid i found that to be a really interesting part of the story he he doesn't try to harm the boy and in fact especially that part where batman is in the houdini water trap the Joker pulls pulls up, you know, he sits next to the boy and even puts his arm around him. Right. And he's like, let's watch this together. And the boy, there's a moment um, where the boy looks at the Joker's hand on the boy's shoulder, like on his shoulder. He's looking at that like completely, I don't know if the boy's creeped out by it or just confused, but I think that's to tell us like the Joker is, is, Connecting with this kid, he's... But, he's... but he could also be reveling in creeping out this kid. Totally, totally. There's this sense... Either way, he's connecting. He's either, he's either like, if the kid sticks around after this, he's a keeper. Or even if he doesn't, I'm creeping him out and that's awesome. <laughs> right. I don't know from this if he's just feeling this sense of companionship with this kid or mentorship with this kid. Because remember, he knows that this kid feels alone feels isolated, um, likes magic, likes stuff that other kids don't like. Like, I think that he, I think that the Joker does connect with this kid in in some way. But I actually think you're also right to say that this may be part of the Joker's kind of thrill-seeking, uh, you know, psychopathology. Like, this is part of his illness. Again, I don't know if it's that he's just finding a moment to connect with this kid and mentor him, or if he's victimizing the kid and he's just getting this you know, huge pleasure out of doing that to him. It's unclear to me. Okay, so now it's that time of the show uh, where we go to Twitter or to Facebook and we take a fan's question. Okay, so this week's question comes from Prime Primeson over on Twitter. Uh, the question is, any chance you can go into the psychology of the mayor a little? 
He definitely has a change of heart later, but seems quite formal and easily disgruntled even around his own son. He's the face of the city and has to keep up appearances, but seems too formal, like he has something to lose if he isn't. It's interesting. Like, let, let's talk about those people who uh, put put their jobs first. Uh, you know, he's basically using his kid in order to get all these powerful people together in one place. Um Let's talk a little bit about the mayor. Yeah, I mean, he was, I think, just even from the beginning of the episode, he's trying to make this claim or trying to push this agenda. And even we, as as people in the audience, we know that he's he's just trying to shape the perceptions of um, the citizens. And it's interesting that he's clearly, you know, all about his appearance, his... Um, what I mean is his, his political positioning, his political right. appearance, his, you know, what what we would call impression management. Like he's he's all about trying to make a good impression and to have really important, strong relationships politically. And his son is almost, um, you know, a conduit for that. His He has this huge birthday party for his son and his son points out, like, I don't have any friends here. These are all your friends these are all your colleagues and you know we get the sense that this is clearly just for um for his father's benefit not for his child and we also see that as we talked about before he doesn't have a strong relationship with jordan he's really dismissive and almost berates him about his hobby of magic he's kind of cold and distant he you know half the time he doesn't know where he is and when he went missing it took him a while to figure out that he was gone so the episode really built that up where you know the father and son are really distant and aren't connecting and this child has needs that his father isn't meeting and you know what this father has needs that this child is isn't meeting either he's rejecting of him he runs away from the party kind of makes a scene so you know it's sort of bad all around now later at the end of the episode we see his father is apologizing and you know just holds him and hugs him and and he points out that he had been wrong i think that's i think what's more telling is that batman is watching this father and son bonding and holding each other and um connecting and he's he's certainly proud that he was able to bring this child back to his father and essentially save his life but i wonder if some part of that was fulfilling bruce wayne's needs you know of course we know that he lost his father right. when he was a kid maybe around the same age that jordan is and so it could be you know it could be a way this is a, what i'm saying is this is more about bruce wayne's psychology than the mayor gotcha so this is the time of the week where um i bring out a real case from history um, and associate it to someone within the show. And this one's a little obvious, um, I know, but uh, I, and I almost feel dirty going here because I, I try to avoid this comparison when possible. However, something you've talked about um, leads me right to it. And uh, this week I'm choosing Pogo the Clown. Most people know Pogo by his real name, John Wayne Gacy. Oh my. The killer clown. That's right. right. This is a guy who wanted to have a hand in uh, the community. He really wanted to be known by politicians and, and you know, people in the higher up, the, the elite um, of his town. And he became uh, a clown, mainly for the purposes of, of entertaining children, but also being uh, invited to major parties and entertaining and things like that. This is a man who at one point even had a photograph taken with President Carter's wife. Um, and she sent him the photo signed of the two of them together. Like, like this is a guy, he, he became a bit of a minor celebrity in town as Pogo the Clown. Wow. Um, what people didn't realize, and in some cases, you know, years later, really, is that children started disappearing. Um, young boys, young boys, young men started disappearing. Um, I believe 33 of them disappeared. Uh, and it was later determined that he under the guise of this clown, had been kidnapping boys and, and would later, ultimately, he killed them. Um, now, I don't want, I feel really weird comparing him to the Joker simply because, um, you know, it's that obvious they're both clowns. Um, and we don't know that the real Jekko 
was a John Wayne Gacy type. I, I get the right. sense that he probably wasn't, but maybe that's part of his charm. Um, however, it's interesting that you bring up antisocial personality disorder because John Wayne Gacy, it was concluded by psychologists, actually was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of lends itself very well to this particular episode. Um, maybe the Joker is a John Wayne Gacy type, and instead of taking the young boy and killing him, he was instead trying to mentor him. Um, well, it's, it's, I mean, I think it's an interesting comparison because clearly the Joker is, you know, callous and lacks empathy and is willing to murder, but he doesn't harm children. I mean, up to this point, He's, I mean, he's been willing to. I mean, he was going to set the bomb off at the party. Um, right. We don't know how many children were on that train he was going to blow up in Christmas with the Joker. Right. Um, anyone, any child who had inhaled the Joker gas um, in the uh, uh, in the last laugh may have. I mean. I don't know that he's necessarily against it, but we've not right. seen them. We've not seen the Joker specifically go after children. Right. He doesn't victimize children. And he didn't in this case. He didn't mean to kidnap no. this boy. No. Um, but I, I think that's. I go, it reminds me of you know again the title of this episode, which is "Be a Clown." Right. Um, and when you said that, that's essentially what John Wayne Gacy did. Yeah. He he became a clown. Yes. And I wonder. I mean, I'm thinking even about the. Um, the title screen. What do you call that? The the title card, yeah. I'm thinking of the title card and you see It's a very creepy yeah. but beautiful silhouette. I mean it's a it is you know, this sort of rusty reddish color and it's a silhouette. It's two shadows of a clown uh, holding hands with a small boy. Mm -hmm. Um and then, you know, in that uh, cursive font in that very playful, bubbly cursive font. Right. It's be a clown. I, it's it sort of captures um, the duality of this episode, which of course is you know the the be a clown messaging. It, it means what does that mean? It means be yourself, enjoy yourself, practice your magic tricks, um, really be out there and seek your pleasures. And it also means entertain, be social, be you know have that sense of freedom. And have that sense of, of, of sociability. And then there's the darker side of that. The the real kind of um, menacing part of that. Which is part of that pleasure comes from other people's pain. Um, you know, and, and that whole that whole kind of weird um, aspect that clowns can be scary. Especially for some kids. I mean, right. I can't tell you how many kids I've seen that have like clown phobias. Absolutely. Um, so there's, you know, that there's always that interesting duality of, of like, it's cheerful, it's good, it's, it's all, you know, it's nice. And then that other side of like, no, it's frightening and scary and, and potentially, you know, dangerous. I, I can't help being reminded of that movie, It. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, speaking of which, uh, I don't know how many people know this, but um, Tim Curry according to Paul Dini, was originally cast as the Joker prior to Mark Hamill. In the animated series. In the animated series. However, uh, his vocal cords weren't quite up to the task of regularly performing this Joker voice, so they recast him with Mark Hamill. And I believe, if uh, rumor is true, that um, Tim Curry's laugh can be heard um, as the robot, the, the clown robot at the amusement park in this episode. <laughs> That's terrifying altogether. So that's our episode, Be a Clown. Um, join us next week when we take a look at episode 10, the first part of an amazing two-parter, Two-Face. I'm so excited for this one. I know you are, because you are particularly, you love this episode. I do, and before I do anything, I flip a coin so that I know what I'm supposed to do. So yeah, if folks have any questions, I mean, this is a great time for folks to ask psychology questions about Two-Face, anything from his transformation into Two-Face to, you know, what what is it, what is really going on with his personalities, please um, write to us. Yeah, you can find us at uh, underthemaskonline.com. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter. We are at Arkham Sessions. 
Or you can find us. We are The Arkham Sessions on Facebook. We are accepting questions for Dr. Letamendi. Um, next week is a big one. So if you've got questions, please ask. Until then, I'm Brian Ward. And I'm Andrea Letamendi. And we are The Arkham Sessions. See you next week. Bye. 